Hey everybody, welcome to this special feature for Zelda Dungeon. I'm David Lasby and I'm here with David Howe, uh, who works on the Castlevania project for our Powerhouse Animation. How you doing, David? I'm doing pretty well. How are you doing, David? Awesome. Yeah, we've got the David to David connection here. Oh yeah. Thank you so much for joining me. I, I know that you are super busy at this time, particularly as we're <laughs> moving towards launch date for the new season. And I'm sure you've got lots of projects you're working on. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Very, very excited for the uh, the world to see season four uh, this uh, wow. May 13th. Yeah, awesome. it's going to be it's going to be awesome. Castlevania was the show that completely changed my perspective on anime and got me uh, involved. And now I'm like binging through every show I can find that I've, yeah. I've missed out on. But yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Before I started working uh, at at Powerhouse, I was already a, a massive fan of the show. Uh, I got hired on like during season three. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like I, it was just an amazing opportunity to work for the show. Just being able to work on a video game show in general. And then a show that I already love so much and just already had such a high bar for quality. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's been an amazing opportunity. I'm I'm so happy to work on it. Oh yeah, I could see that. That would kind of feel like a dream come true a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big Castlevania just franchise fan in general too. I, I loved all the games, especially the Game Boy Advance games. So oh. yeah, very excited to work on this stuff. Well, um, you kind of actually already talked a little bit about it, but one of the first questions I wanted to ask you today for Zelda Dungeon is just uh, if you don't mind, tell the our readers a little bit about yourself. Um, how did you get into content editing? Uh, yeah, well, um, I mean, I've been basically like been doing video editing since high school. Uh, you know, like the very first days of me editing were like, you know, doing the, the video announcements and and the kind of broadcast club or whatever in high school. And that got me like way into editing. Um, and I just kind of found out that it was a skill that I had at that point. Um, and then, yeah, I went to, uh, university of Texas, uh, with a degree in radio, television, film. Um, and so I did a lot of editing then I, I shot my first like short film. It was a thesis film called Unicycho, uh, in college. And then, um, yeah, since then I've, you know, just been like working for kind of random companies. I worked for an e-learning company where I did a lot of um, like audio engineering and editing. And then since then, I, I shot a short film uh, that I wrote called The Woo, um, which is online. Awesome. Uh, and then uh, a feature film uh, that I directed uh, and edited called Call Me Brother. Um, and that's that's out right now. Um, people can watch that. Uh, I didn't write that one, but it was it was. I directed it and it was kind of starring the whole Austin comedy community. Um, so yeah, so I've always, always been into film and filmmaking and stuff like that. And, um, yeah, as far as like working for powerhouse is concerned, um, you know, I was actually like unemployed for, for like five or six months for a while and like banging my head against the wall, like trying to apply to a bunch of places. And, uh, and I actually like during that time too, had this like messed up back surgery, uh, that left me in the hospital. Oh, and it was actually like while I was in the hospital that a friend reached out and was like, hey, we're actually looking for editors. And so I like applied and like edited the the test while I was in the hospital bed <laughs> and shit like that. And then, you know, because I was in the hospital for like three weeks or something like that. So it was like it was definitely something to look forward to. And then I got the job right afterwards. So it's like it was definitely like good timing uh, for my mental health <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to get I'll, that job right at that time. Yeah, 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 All those things going on, I can imagine. And then it's like an amazing opportunity that just happened. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it all, it all just kind of like worked out in a really good way, I think. Um, but yeah, you know, it's uh, filmmaking, like directing and then editing in general have just always been passions of mine. Um, and then, you know, obviously video games as well. I'm a huge gamer. I have been my whole life. Um, so yeah, the stars all kind of aligned with, with this, uh, Castlevania project and working with powerhouse. Do you mind, uh, as much as you're able to say, of course, like what exactly do you do there and what has that experience been like for you? Yeah, so um, at at Powerhouse, I am an editor uh, and I work on animatics. Um, so I'm kind of uh, at a couple uh, points in the uh, production pipeline. So like early on, I'm working with the storyboard artists, and um, you know we'll get you know storyboards in, and they're kind of all stitched together into an animatic form. So at that point in the process, it's really early on. This is before anything goes to outsourcing or, or in-betweening or anything like that. So at that point in the process, I'm kind of working directly with the storyboard artists and then adding in basically all 
temporary sound effects and music at that point. Um, so I'm kind of already fucking around with the timing and apologies for swearing. Uh, <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm messing around with, uh, timing and editing and the flow, but then, yeah, also kind of like figuring out what the tone is going to be with temp music and sound effects and stuff like that. Um, and so I'll do that for every single episode. And so by the time we send stuff out to outsourcing and in-betweeners, they're working with the animatics that I've helped put together with the director. Um, and then basically the kind of the second part of my job is once we get all the in-betweens back uh, from our outsourcing uh, departments and, and the people that we work with, um, then I'm working with the compositors on, you know, getting each one of those shots that are, you know, quote unquote completed, um, you know, filled up with, you know, effects and different lighting and coloring and stuff like that. And then it's like kind of doing a second round of, of timing and editing and making sure all the dialogue and actions flowing well as we get it into premiere. Wow. That, that must be so exciting. Do you ever find yourself just like nerding out for a minute when oh, they yeah. send something your way for the story or totally. Yeah. I mean, well, it's, it's cool seeing stuff for the first time in the storyboard form, right? Cause you already have in your head what you think or know it's going to look like eventually. Right? right. Especially on a show like Castlevania where it's like, there's already multiple seasons up to that point. So, you know, the style, you know how it's going to look. Um, but then, yeah, I mean, I, I love the post process as well because it's like, you know, you're getting stuff back and it's, it, it's good and it's fully animated, but it's still like pretty rough. And then every single iteration that the compositors hit on it, it just looks better and better and better and better until all the effects are added in until the lighting is done. And then it just like all of a sudden looks incredible. And so being there kind of every step of the way, um, I really get to see the whole episode grow and bloom like step by step. And it's, yeah, it's a blast. So this might be a weird question, but having done a lot of writing myself over the years, I, I know that I can work with a passage so often that I, I can't look at it anymore because I've just oh, been yeah. it too much. Do, are you still able to enjoy watching the show once it comes out? Or do you feel like you need space from it for a while after pouring so many hours into it? No, I think I'm able to still to still enjoy it. And I think like because I that hasn't been the case with stuff that I've like written and directed and edited myself. You know, a lot of times, like for Call Me Brother, for instance, like I'm really proud of that movie. I think that movie is, is really funny and really good. But it's like, I'm pretty much done watching that movie. <laughs> you know? Like I've seen that movie like hundreds of times now. And it's right. like just throughout the process of working on it. And, you know, I was there every day on set and shooting and working with everybody. So like I'm really intimately familiar with that stuff. But like animation is such a uh, hugely collaborative process. And there's just so many different people all doing different shit. And like everybody that I work with, you know, like I, I feel like I'm one of the few people at, at like in, at least at this studio, but in animation in general, that really comes from a live action background, you know, mm. where I didn't start in animation. So it's like, I'm working with just tons of like incredible artists, you know? And it's, it so it's fresh. like, yeah, it feels fresh. And I'm just like constantly in awe of like, you know, like I can't draw like that. I can't animate, you sure. know? So it's like, so it's like, I'm, I'm always in awe at, at a lot of the stuff that we do uh, and a lot of the stuff my, my coworkers are able to do. So it doesn't really get tiring for me. In fact, I had to stop. I had to like stop watching some of season four. I was like reviewing it recently and I was like, you know, what? I'm going to wait until it's on Netflix and just watch it. It's like on saving it. Oh, man. That's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. awesome. Well, you know, I've had the chance to interact with you uh, a little bit on Twitter, and I know that you're a fan of Legend of Zelda series. Totally. Uh, tell us about that. Are, are there any personal favorites in terms of games or characters in the series for you? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, I know it's like a little old hat at this point, and I feel like it's a lot of people's favorites, but just like Ocarina of Time was like the transformative game for me, you know, like that's I'd played. Before that, I'd played a little bit of Link's Awakening, and I'd played just like a brief bit of Link to the Past. Mm -hmm. But it was really Ocarina of Time was the first one that like I really sank my teeth into, you know. And I was, I guess, I was like ten when that came out. It was nineteen ninety eight, so like, you know, I just my brain was filled with wonder, and it, it actually, I, I don't know if this is appropriate to show, but uh, oh, go for it. <laughs> I uh, when I was. Uh, in 1999 and 2000, uh, wrote uh, some like f fan fiction books. Oh, uh, that is awesome. Uh, this Legend of Zelda Generations was um, it's supposed to be like kind of a prequel to Ocarina of Time, uh, and then uh, this is like a sequel to this book. So it was like, you know, and you got him hardbound. 
Yeah, well, it was like whatever thing yeah. they did back in fourth grade, That's right? So great. Yeah. <laughs> but it was like uh it was like, you know, hey, we got it published, but it's like really inside. It's just my handwritten stuff. But That's but yeah, so it's like the it, as like a creative kid, you know, mm-hmm. in kind of the 10, 11 year old age, the kind of the whole just world of it and the world building of the Zelda franchise, like really jump started my creativity a lot. And um, yeah, so those will always kind of be the most special ones to me. Although I will say like Breath of the Wild 2 is like the first Zelda game I've played since then that gave me that same sense of wonder and excitement, right? Like, I mean, I love Twilight Princess and I love uh, uh, Wind Waker, but it's like Breath of the Wild was... Breath of the Wild, like, now is what it felt like when I played Ocarina of Time for the first time, you know what I mean? I like, yeah, back when I thought, oh, my God, this is the biggest world I've ever seen. I t- that that really resonates with me so much. I, I'm uh, 36, so I, we're probably similar generations in terms yeah. of gaming, and, um, you know, a lot of those games you mentioned really hit it for me, too, and, um, yeah, that Breath of the Wild really was the first game that made me feel like, you know, I was a kid again, first exploring those, you know, <laughs> Very yeah. small by modern standards, Hyrule, but it felt huge then. I know. I constantly wish I could just forget everything that I did when I played Breath of the Wild and play it again for the go first time. Every time I go back to play it, I'm like, I kind of get a little sidetracked and I move on to another game. So that's why I just can't wait for Breath of the Wild too, man. I, oh, need, it. I need it right now. <laughs> well, here's the hoping at E3. Um, yeah, we'll see, right? So, uh, let's see, I asked you about that. So speaking... Um, solely on your own just just to get that really obvious and out of the way not on behalf of powerhouse animation or anything right. yeah, uh, yeah you've mentioned that you'd support the idea of a zelda anime what do you think that the iconic franchise um wh- excuse me why do you think that the iconic nintendo franchise would make a great anime um well i mean i think there's precedent for it you know uh sorry i got something in my eye uh i think there's precedent for it it's like you know I, like i personally own a couple uh copies of the the ocarina of time manga mm-hmm. um so they've already kind of adapted it into a serialized like manga format and then of course you've got i've got this one over here too sorry i have so many props but this uh the uh link to the past oh, yeah. uh, the power comic you know so i think it's just like and you know i think if something works in a manga format it would really work in an anime and 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 i think also it's like like i said the world building i think I personally would much rather see a serialized like TV show format for Zelda as opposed to a movie. Like I I think a movie could work, but it's like, I just think that having the time to really explore, like I was talking about earlier, I love the world building, you know, and, and, and just the, the breadth of the world. And, and, and I think having the time to really explore that um, kind of in a serialized format would work really well. It would also kind of follow the structure of the games that are, you know, temple based or boss based you know you could kind of lump those into single or, or double episode arcs that would be great yeah I would, you know that's often something that i think about writing about zelda a lot myself i I've, I've tried to ask myself this question you know how could you turn something like that that's so puzzle based or theme based into something that's really viewable because you know nobody wants to watch you solve a puzzle for you know 15 minutes on a show right <laughs> sure. but but you bring up a good point about serializing it and maybe having like themes or chunks of the show deal with different regions. I, that, sure, you know, yeah. It seems like something that could work. I think that's something that anime already does really well anyway. Like I've been watching Demon Slayer recently I'll and it's see. like, yeah, it's, you know, there'll be like, there will be single episodes. So it's just like a little side quest, right? Or there's like five episode arcs that would be like the shadow temple or something. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. they kind of go to different areas. And even in live action too, you look at something like Mandalorian um, and that show just feels like a filmed video game. You know, he's like totally. doing different side quests to level up his armor and like yeah, <laughs> and fight point. the final <laughs> boss. Like it's, it's, it's I, I think the lines, you know, the lines between like film and video games have been blurring already a ton on the video game side. And I think it's happening more and more in the, the film and TV side as well, where we're seeing a lot more influence from both. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, thinking back to, you know, coming from a similar generation here, I, I think one thing that's always maybe worried folks who have come through the 1980s Legend of Zelda cartoon and Super Mario movies is like, can it be something that's taken seriously? And you raise a good point about the manga (laughs) working out so well that it really could then just jump to the screen. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. 
And I think, you know, it's also we're at a different point now with video games than we were in the 80s, you know, like video games are just considered an art form now so much more than they ever were in the 80s. You know, it was still very much for children. You know, that Zelda show is fun to watch, but it's like, you know, it's a Saturday morning cartoon, you know, like I think I think we're talking about if there was, you know, my dream of like a Zelda anime adaptation, like it would definitely you know, I wouldn't say it would be for adults. It wouldn't be a hard R like Castlevania. I think that would be alienating for a lot of people. But I think just taking it seriously and giving the story and the world and the characters the respect they deserve, I think that that would be a lot easier to do these days than it would be in the 80s. Right, that's a great point. Um, so so you seem to be pretty open to it, and, and you've said all your reasons why you think that it could really work. I'm curious, how common is that perspective in the industry that you work in more specifically are there others in animation and production business not not just for the company you work for but just Mm -hmm. being around the industry that think a zelda anime could happen i mean i totally you know i think that um i know i know me personally and, and probably some some people i know that i've talked to as well whenever there were the rumors about like a live action netflix show uh like zelda show You know, obviously, like we were pumped, but at the same time, it was like, I feel like this would maybe even work better as an anime, you know, like or work better animated in general. Um, But I think, yeah, I think obviously it would work. I think that there are so many franchises that could work. And I know, you know, again, I don't want to speak for my coworkers, but, you know, if you look around the the office at, at Powerhouse Animation, you know, we're all nerds and we're all huge fans of, you know, Zelda and Metroid and and all that kind of stuff and it's like you know you'll see you know Star Wars and all that kind of nerd stuff it's all over the walls like I feel like anybody would jump at the bit to to be able to make a a show like this in fact like I was I was thinking about it recently about just you know some of my all-time franchises I would want to do and I feel like Zelda would be so much easier to do than something like Mario I feel like if somebody came to me and they're like hey we want you to make like a Mario anime I would just be so terrified. It's like, how do you do that? You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> like that feels like that would be a lot harder than Zelda. It's like, at, at least with Zelda, you've got the, the kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, the kind of archetypal right. pattern that all the Zelda stories kind of follow. You've got at the very least that to pull from. Right. right. Um, so even if it's not a direct adaptation of one of the games, like you can follow the same general plot structure of, of that all the Zelda games share. Absolutely. I hope that answered your question. Oh yeah, no, it, it's that's great stuff. So I guess kind of some follow up with that um, through your work on the Castlevania anime, have you drawn any inspiration or gained a vision for what a Zelda anime could look like? And I know you've talked a little bit about, you know, it being serialized or you know dealing with the the plot in terms of chunks. Um, but, you know, maybe more specifically, is there anything from Castlevania that you think would translate over well to a Zelda anime? Um, yeah, well, definitely all the swearing and nudity. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Nintendo will be right, right there for that. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, I think, uh, yeah, I think it's, I think it's like the, the gravity and, and, and the stakes, right? Um, I think, like I, we were talking about earlier about taking it seriously and giving it reverence, you know, and, and treating it, treating it like, I, I think the reason Castlevania works so well is that it's, it's treated with tons of respect and like, like it's a prestige like franchise, you know, um, the writing is incredible on Castlevania. It's one of the things I love so much about it. Um, and I think that also another thing that works really well about Castlevania that if, anybody you know is going to be adapting a zelda anime uh to to look out for is like not being so faithful to the source material to where it doesn't work as a story right like i think that's what castlevania does really well that i'm a big fan of is like yeah of course it it draws lots of inspiration from the games there are plot points that are directly lifted from some of the games but all in all it's also it's very much its own thing right um i don't think that in you know and i i can't speak for the writing of the show but as as i understand it like they kind of took what worked and then formed that into a story that that worked in and of itself right and I would just hate to see someone, you know, be so faithful to the storyline 
to where it wouldn't necessarily work. Um, you know, for instance, you know, one of the big hurdles of adapting Zelda into either a movie or a TV show is what you do with Link, right? Because right. he's, he's silent in all the games. So what do you do? Um, I, I personally think it would probably be pretty awkward if you had a completely silent protagonist in an anime, right? But then, you know, a lot of the struggle then is like figuring out what voice do we give this kid, right? Or adult, depending on if it's depending the adult or game. child version, right? Yeah. Uh, you could have both if you do Ocarina, like, please. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, you know, so it's like, it's just getting, I think it's, that's why you need to spend a bunch of time early on in the writing process, you know, and getting a really good pitch document together and getting all that stuff ready. And probably, I don't know exactly how it works in working with Nintendo. I personally never really have, but it's like making sure early on that you have a shared vision of how it's going to go rather than like, you know, just being completely unprepared uh, by the time it comes out. Yeah, you know, you, you bring up a couple interesting things. I want to revisit for just a moment this idea of being too faithful to the script of the games. It, it seems like what you're getting at is this idea that Castlevania borrowed from the universe or borrowed from the sort of the lore and then told a good story. And it, yeah. it seems like that opportunity exists for Zelda where you have these very rich worlds to then just go write your own story. Yeah. Like I said, there, there's like a mythos, you know, mm-hmm. look at Skyward Sword, right? Like Skyward Sword set up the mythos for every Zelda game that comes after it chronologically, right? So it's like, as long as you follow that same basic plot, then I think it works really well. And, you know, uh, I think probably one of the big exceptions to that is probably like Majora's Mask, right? Like Majora's Mask deviates awesome. hugely. Yeah. Although I'd love to see an adaptation of Majora's Mask just like sure. straight up. That would be <laughs> amazing too. <laughs> I mean, we're we're all just kind of hype. This is the hype train here, you know? Right. It's just what I'd love to see. But like, but yeah, I mean, I think that I think I think what Castlevania does really well is like, you know, you know, Trevor Belmont is the is kind of the Belmont of the Castlevania show, right? Of Netflix's Castlevania. And so it's like, you know, that's, um, uh, you know, that's Castlevania three. So it's like, cool. We've got Castlevania three to work off of, you know, if you're talking about it from a, like a, uh, kind of structuring out an entire season or a story, right. You have that as your base, right. And then you kind of grow off of that and your tendrils take you wherever they may, uh, Mm -hmm. You know, and the characters will then themselves push the story forward, and you can learn a lot from the characters of your own story, right? As you're writing, right. so I think that would be that would be my suggestion to whoever would be eventually uh, working on this show if it ever does happen, um, which I hope it does. But it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's like take a game that everybody knows. Use that as the base, but then don't be too worried about sticking to it exactly. Just follow the same basic path and see where the story takes itself. So do you think, I I know you mentioned, obviously there are certain sort of adult elements of Castlevania that wouldn't work, you know, in a Nintendo franchise that's, you know, maybe not totally needing to be kid-friendly, but certainly needing to be kid-accessible. Sure. Um, What about that sort of gritty element of... Castlevania. And I guess what I'm getting at, you mentioned Demon Slayer earlier. That's an anime that I'm watching right now as well. And, you know, the the show has its very serious moments, but then it also has these very goofy moments. Mm -hmm. Whereas, like, a show like Castlevania doesn't do that. Is that part of taking the story seriously? Do you see that just as a style thing? And and how would that work with a Zelda? I think it's it's a style thing, right? It's like, because, I mean, I feel like Demon Slayer, were it not for the intense gore of the like decapitations and you know like people getting chopped up into little bits and entrails and all that shit (laughs) like i feel like that show feels almost like you know i feel like that could be a kid's show you know it feels almost like dragon ball z or something in that way where it's like you know like i said kind of mission based is what that show is like right and it's i feel like that is the most intense part of that show um but it's still taken seriously, right? You know, there's still stakes. There's still like very real consequences um, in it, within Demon Slayer. Um, Castlevania, I feel, is the same way. You know, I think that, you know, obviously it's telling a more adult story and there's a lot more adult themes. But I also think that uh, Castlevania is not without its lighter moments and its comedy. You know, I, there's lots of there's lots of humor in that show. It just doesn't seem like it 
at like you know at first but then when you're actually watching it it's like oh man like these characters are really endearing and they're all making jokes it's sometimes too much <laughs> but it's like but it's like great and i think it, it makes the characters more likable right having those moments i think it comes down to like a style thing you know like uh you know Castlevania is is branded as an anime, but that's also kind of controversial because it's it's mostly made here in Texas. You know, mm-hmm. it's an Amer- we're a, an American studio that that does all the animation. Um, you know, and then Frederator, who 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 owns the show, you know, they're they're in the states, and and um, it's, it, all the cast is is from the UK for the most part, and so so it's like I think that. In, you know, in something like Demon Slayer, you have moments where it's a little more stylized and the characters will turn into chibi versions of themselves or whatever. Right. And it's just it's kind of this difference between like the kind of anglicized like anime that we're working on and then traditional Japanese anime, which, you know, for decades and decades has had their own sorts of, um, I don't know, stylistic choices to make things goofy or lighthearted when they need to. Uh, that's a great explanation. I And I, I think it. Yeah, it it makes me wonder a little bit about, you know, Nintendo being a Japanese company. It's a Nintendo I, IP, right? Like what I wonder what that final stylistic decision would be. Right. It, particularly if it was picked up from a company like Netflix, you know. Well, yeah, and you, you got to wonder are they going to go with a western studio or a Japanese studio? Mm-hmm. And I think that if they were going to go with a Japanese studio, why hadn't why haven't they done it already, right? Right. Um, you know, you look at uh, the Mario movie that's coming out next year. That's Illumination Studios. That's a Western studio. Um, you know, they the, the Minions, right? So it's like that's you know that's them taking a a, a big uh, risk as far as a, you know Nintendo of Japan or whatever is very Japanese centric and always has been. Um, you know, and I think with good reason. You know, we saw how the 1993 Mario Brothers movie came out last time. They took a risk on that, right? You right. can see how they'd be hesitant for a long time. I love that movie, but it's like it's a classic not for very good. different reasons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like a kid's Blade Runner, is what I've always said. That's right. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but it's like um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I I'd love I'd love to see Nintendo reach out more to Western, um. Uh, artists in in just lots of ways, you know, and I, I think we're seeing that too with, you know, stuff like Mercury Steam working on the Metroid game. Um, you know, Nintendo feels like they're now in an era where they're reaching out a little bit more and following different avenues instead sure. of staying instead of staying so tightly knit within their kind of pre uh, pre allowed like Japanese. Uh, I don't know the word I'm looking for. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No. Totally. Um, so, so last follow up question with that then, is there a particular franchise that you would like, or not franchise, excuse me, uh, sort of game universe within the Zelda franchise that you would like to see be explored first? I know you mentioned Ocarina of Time. Yeah. Certainly I can imagine like the Wind Waker series being a little bit more lighthearted if that was right. into a show or right. something dark and gritty like Twilight Princess or Majora's Mask. What, what do you, what would you hope for if? You know, David Howe's given total con- creative control here. Yeah, Maybe yeah, even yeah. Like two different shows that you get to launch simultaneously. What What are you yeah. launching? Well, um, I don't know. I mean, you know, obviously, my my heart would say Ocarina of Time. I think you have the most freedom there mm-hmm. because I'm also just like a huge sucker for like time travel plots. Um, you know, I've always loved that, and so you've got a very easy to follow and tangible way to show like the same world but kind of ravaged with time right kind of like the light world and the dark world and link to the past it's like it's like that but you get to play with time in that way and then also it would be fun i think to do a show like that because then you get to you'd get to know the characters as children like the kakiri and stuff like that and then transition into link being an adult and revisiting those characters i think you could have lots of really great like dramatic and comedic moments like with the Kakiri uh, and then, you know, just people in like Kakariko village and stuff like that, you know, just playing with that time passage, I think would be really fascinating. And that could even be something you could split up into like multiple seasons. Right. If you wanted to. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Man, uh, that seems like there's so much potential there. Yeah. Yeah. I'd much rather that than something like breath of the wild. I feel like Ocarina of time is, is more like story focused than breath of the wild and breath of the wild story is still being told. So I wouldn't really want it to be explored necessarily in any other medium right now other than games. But, um, yeah, that, like I said before, I think Majora's mask would be like insane. 
I think Majora's Mask would probably make a good movie, uh, honestly. You know, I think it's like a shorter story. It can be told m- with more brevity. It's more kind of self-contained and less sure. Um it's very, Kind of like David Lynchian, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah. that actually, that kind of bleeds into my next question a little bit. So given that there's a new Mario movie coming in 2022, what are what are the odds that you think Nintendo would allow Zelda be to to make it to the big screen versus to a platform like Netflix? It, let's say Nintendo is going to do something, right? Do they go more towards the big screen or do they go towards a series on on Netflix? Well, I mean, there, it seems certainly that they're trending towards the big screen, which of course, don't get me wrong, I'm all for. You know, I'm gonna be sure. there. I'm gonna we'll be there day. Whatever. I'll be there day one to watch the Mario movie. Like I've been, you know, Mario world was my first video game when i was like two years old so it's like yeah i'm 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 there for it um and i mean if they did a zelda movie of course i'd be there day one as well um i mean i i would probably like i'd said before i'd probably prefer to see it in a serialized format um i just think they'd have more freedom that way and i think it'd be part of the public consciousness for a little bit longer if it were in a show uh rather than a movie but i mean we'll see i think i think I don't think Nintendo themselves even know. I know they're talking to the CEO of Illumination right now. I think that news actually just came out yeah. today that we're talking that, you know, they're, outside you know, director. yeah, it's an outside director. They're talking about more animated projects, you know, which gives me a little bit of pause because I don't know how cartoony and CG I want my Zelda, right? If that yeah. is what they're doing, uh, maybe it's, you know, uh, Pikmin or Kirby or something, but, but I think, um, yeah, I, I think that they're kind of doing a wait and see approach. I mean, I'm sure they're talking behind the scenes, but once Mario comes out and the box office numbers for that come in, I think that's when Nintendo is going to really start to evaluate like, oh, shit, like we should probably be doing this with all our franchises. Right. Yeah. Um, then then, you know, it's time to green light the F-Zero anime. Right? The, oh, man. The, the second coming <laughs> of the F-Zero anime. That would probably crash Twitter for a, a day. Yeah. yeah. Or Metroid. That would be yeah. good, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, as we kind of wrap up, um, just, just out of curiosity, do you, do you have a favorite character on Castlevania or, you know, a couple characters Ooh. that you are most excited to see their their arcs wrap up in this final season? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I'm going to try to dance around any, any, yeah, of course. Here, but yeah. it's like, I mean, certainly Alucard is, is an amazing character. Um, you know, I love the way that he's been played by James Callis in the show. Uh, and he's just kind of like, like a fucking sad boy. That's like, you know, easy to relate to in that way. <laughs> you know, like, uh, uh, I'm a huge Sypha fan as well. Um, if we're talking about the, the main three characters, I love them all, but yeah, Sypha is incredible. And, um, and, and she's got some really great stuff this upcoming season. They all do. Um, one character who was introduced in season three, uh, that we've seen on the poster for season four is, uh, St. Germain. And Jermaine was kind of a new character that was added in, uh, in, in, in season three. I think he's from uh, curse of darkness originally, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and he's like a really fascinating character played by Bill Nye, um, who I'm a big fan of as an actor. And, and so hearing him voice the character is super fun. Uh, and yeah. And so we know he's in season, f- I can say he's in season four cause he's in the poster. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think people will be interested to see where his story takes him for sure. Awesome. Uh, a favorite? Do you have a favorite antagonist? Favorite antagonist? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you got to I mean, you got to go with Daddy Vladdy, uh, <laughs> Dracula Tepesh, right? Yeah, I mean, Dra- I mean, Dra- Dra- you know, that's that's part of the reason that I fell in love with the show immediately, right? Is like, uh, you know, you see Dracula in in tons of media right and then obviously the the castlevania version of dracula is very much his own version apart from like bram stoker or whatever but it's like the the netflix castlevania dracula i think is by far my favorite incarnation of the character i think he's the most you know personified or what's the word complete Yeah. I mean, you just like feel for the guy, you know what I mean? Like, like obviously he's a total maniac and was waging war on humanity and just murdering tons of people. But also like, I'd probably be pretty pissed too if somebody burned (laughs) my wife alive, you know, like, like, I just think they like did such a good job in, in writing, uh, this incarnation of Dracula for the show. And, um, 
Yeah, and and also just you know, and spoiler alert, in season two when he eventually bites the dust, you know, like him at the end having that moment where you know he just breaks into tears uh, because he realizes you know how insane he's become and and you know and as he's like killing his son Alucard he's like man what was I doing this for is and like the regret of that character was so palpable and I really felt for him in that moment so it's like you know again everybody's gonna say Dracula but yeah how can you not say Dracula he's he's an incredible villain yeah yeah well is there anything else that you'd like to share with our readers at Zelda Dungeon as we wrap up Oh, sure. I mean, I've, you know, I've been reading Zelda Dungeon for a long time, so it's cool to do an interview <laughs> with you guys. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling for it. You know, again, I'm only speaking on, on behalf of myself and not on behalf of, of Powerhouse Animation, but it's, I would love to see a show made uh, of The Legend of Zelda. And, and even if not, you know, I, I've gotten to the point where it's like, and I think video games have gotten to the point where you can use gameplay to tell such a singular storytelling mm. experience that sometimes things don't even have to really be adapted, right? Because it's, you know, the game is oftentimes the best way to tell a story. So it's like, if it doesn't happen, that's fine. If it does happen, though, that would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely part of that, you know, video games becoming their own art form that's distinct from some of those other right. ones. Yeah, about. it's like, do, like, do they need to make a Half-Life movie? I don't think so. Right. I think I think that's the best possible way you could ever tell the Half-Life story is in first person, you know, over like one long period of time, you know? So it's like, no, Zelda, on the other hand, I think you could, you know, and like I said, the manga has already proven that they can tell that story in other ways. Um, but, you know, it's, um, I'd certainly love to see it. And um, yeah, I mean, it would be, you know, you saw my... Uh, my fan fiction from when I was a kid. I would, I would that would be a dream job, right? Working. You got on your Zelda. source material right there. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yo, Nintendo, hit me up, man. I've got, I've got the story ready to go. Is I wrote it when I was in fourth grade, and it, it still slaps. Well, <laughs> um, David, uh, where can people find you? Yeah. Um. So you can find me personally on like Twitter and and Instagram and all that stuff. I'm at Monolith Fiji, pretty much everywhere on the internet. Uh, also, if I can just give a little plug, uh, I do a uh, Nintendo podcast, um, once a week. Uh, it's called Super Switch Heads. Um, we're still kind of a scrappy podcast, but we've got a very like, you know, uh, uh, very dedicated fan base and 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 community. Like our Discord is awesome. Um, but yeah, we, we do new episodes every single week. Um, we'd love if you guys shoot us a follow. We do lots of Zelda themed episodes and, and we talk about all things gaming, not just Nintendo. Um, so yeah, check out Super Switch Heads uh, wherever you can. And download Call Me Brother. It's out there. We need to make yeah, some money. I was going to ask it. you, are there any <laughs> projects that you are working on that you wanted to promote? Yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely Call Me Brother is uh, a, a film of mine. It's definitely uh, an R rated uh, comedy. Uh, so, you know, if you're a younger reader reading this article, you know, maybe ask your parents first. Uh, but yeah, you can check that out for sure. Uh, and then, yeah, like I said, Super Switch Heads. Um, uh, give us a subscribe on YouTube, uh, because if you do, and we hit 250 subscribers, uh, I'll be doing audiobook versions of my Zelda fan fiction. Uh, oh my so you goodness. don't, don't want to happen. You don't want to miss out on that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to do this, David. And all of us at Zelda Dungeon certainly appreciate it. And we're of course. huge fans of the work you're doing. So, Hey, I appreciate it. And thanks for having me on. All right. Thank you.